Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett. Kent Myers has the week off. Thank you for joining us. Our guest today is going to be Gary Jones. Gary is the state auditor. We're going to be taking a big picture perspective of state government, uh, his particular office, and all of the things involved in running the auditing office on a day-to-day -day basis. It's all coming up today on The Verdict. Thanks for joining us. We'll be right back. fortunate enough to premiere every film that I've produced at Sundance. Seeing your film on the big screen for the first time in front of an audience at the Sundance Film Festival is unmatched. I'm Chad Burris. I'm an attorney, film producer, film financier, economic development financier, and I'm Chickasaw. Nobody can argue that modern day media, cinema, has perpetuated this myth, this idea of the Indian and what that is. And just the idea that, you know, all Indians look one way or all Indians act one way is a terrible injustice. Being able to have filmmakers tell stories that are representative of some element of his surroundings, his upbringing, what they know, what they see through their own eyes, that other people get a chance to bear witness to um, around the world. I think that's amazing. For me personally, being an Indian today means being responsible, honest, progressive, and giving that back to the community. Learn more about today's Chickasaws at profilesofanation.com. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett, Kent Myers is not here today, but it'll be me solo along with State Auditor Gary Jones. Let me tell you a little bit about Gary. Interesting guy, born on, in, in Fort Sill on the, on the, uh, the base itself, uh, but has spent much of his life in that part of the state. A graduate of Lawton Eisenhower High School, went to Cameron University, got a BA in accounting. He then worked for Bell Telephone for 10 years, then worked as a private business for 16 years. He is a CPA, uh, also a CFE, which is a certified fraud examiner. He has spent four years as a Comanche County Commissioner and then six and a half years as the state chair of the Republican Party. He has been elected state auditor now in his fifth year in that post. And uh, perhaps most importantly, he's been married to Mary Jane for 38 years. Right. Welcome to the show. It's good to be with you. Yeah, and your your home is uh, on a on a farm southwest of Cash, which right. is down near Lawton. We live there for about 36 years now. Yeah. So. And what do you do on the farm? Are you do you are you actually we, wear overalls and get out? And, we and, we and do. Work we the uh, farm? we uh, well, in fact, this Sunday I was uh, I was out early, um, went out checking heifers and and uh, saw a new calf being born and saw one was having trouble, so I had to deliver the new calf, pull the calf, and so I'm, we live on a working farm. We raise My cattle goodness. and have for, for about 33 years now. And uh, how often are you involved in the, in the birthing of a calf? Well, it, this is about, it's been about two or three years. Yeah. And uh, used to, I used to, we used to run about 250 mama cows, run about 100 heifers, and usually the first, first one is the tough. So, yeah. so uh, you know, we were, we were used to pulling about a half dozen a year. That's got to be an incredible experience. To it, it does to, to go through that process and, and you know catch a, mm -hmm. a calf in trouble and then, and then uh, you know once you once you pull it and you drain the mucus and and uh, and watch that process of the mm -hmm. mama taking care of it and the, the baby getting up. It's it's uh, it is quite a spectacle. A working cattle ranch. Any crops on the? On we the we raise we raise a little wheat and a little hay uh, just just primarily to support our, our cattle operation. Okay and let's get a first-hand report. Uh, how has the, the drought been affecting your specific uh, ranch? We uh, we went through a severe drought. We actually sold out uh, in 2010 when I got elected to office. My son uh, joined the Marine, Marine Reserves, volunteered to go to Afghanistan so uh, we're, we're just now getting back into it in the last three years but uh, it's pretty bad. It was, it was uh, you know, we ran about 2,000 acres at that time, and, and you couldn't run a whole lot of cattle because there was very little water, very little stock pond water. And, and so uh, this, when the floods came, we, we actually got our <laughs> ponds filled up and, and uh, grass is growing. We cut hay for the first time in five years. And so, uh, and a lot of people in, west of us over toward the Altus area got hit even worse. Yeah. So it feels like the drought's over? 
uh, it feels like we've had some relief. It's it's dry again. It's it's amazing how quick it dries, but it's uh, it's nothing compared to what it was. If it me. rained tomorrow, you'd take it. Uh, I had a, a neighbor that used to say, "If it's not a rain, he's a wanting to." He said, <laughs> "If it rains too much, he'll go to raisin rice." He said he's never seen too much rain. Sometimes we get a little bit too quick. Well, let's talk a little bit about the state auditing office. For the person who is just vaguely aware that we have a state auditor, may cast a vote every four years, but doesn't hear a whole lot about the auditing office in between time, kind of give us a response, their list of responsibilities. Well, we have a tremendous responsibility. We're the watchdogs for the, pu the public and, and the financial oversight. We audit every county. Statutes say we'll audit county within two years. We came into office and we had counties that had been audited in six years. We worked real hard to get caught up. We're, we're virtually caught up now. Uh, are very close and, and uh, we have a budget that ranges about 11 million dollars a year. We have a staff of 120 employees, have over a dozen CPAs, 100 degreed accountants that uh, that are very professional. They go out and we audit counties, we audit emergency management districts, there's 56 emergency management districts, 27 district attorney districts. Uh, we also can audit schools and cities on special requests uh, and um, you know We've, we've done a lot of those. We have a special division that uh, we have a CPA that heads that up. We have a former FBI agent that's an attorney. We have uh, some police investigators. We have a former postal inspector that are on that staff. So we have a, do, do have a very professional staff there as well. What is the, the financial sophistication at the county level? Does it vary from one county to another? It does quite a bit. I mean, when you look at some counties like Oklahoma and Tulsa County that are doing full financial statements and, and uh, we audit them once a year. Uh, we have to have their audit done by December 31st. Uh, then we do what's called a, a uh, an A133 audit that has to be done by March, and we, we get those completed. If they get federal funds over a certain amount, at uh, over $500,000 a year for the entire county, we have to do that special audit, uh, the A133 a audit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have counties that have a population of about 2,500, and and so uh, we still have to look at their, their financials but it's not nearly as sophisticated as an Oklahoma or Tulsa County would be. Well, I, I'm old enough to remember what we called the county commissioner scandals of the 1980s. How has it changed since then? What was the system like then from an auditing standpoint and what is, what is it like today? Well, the, um, you know, there was a book written about it called Bad Times for Good Old Boys. Before I ran for county commissioner, I read, read about that book. I read the book and, and really got a good understanding of there wasn't enough financial oversight. And so now we are really cognizant of that. Uh, the relationship between vendors and, and uh, the county commissioners that are they're making the decisions. Um, one of the recommendations out of that scandal was that we go to what's called a budget board. And that's where instead of the three county commissioners would be in charge of making all the financial decisions, you would have greater oversight because all the eight elected county officials, uh, Oklahoma County, Tulsa County, and several, uh, a few others operate on the budget board. Uh, but what they did is they made it optional as opposed to mandatory. I think in most cases the counties that have a budget board operate a little more efficiently mm -hmm. and have, they provide greater oversight themselves. Uh -huh. And of the audits you do, 77 different counties, right. how many of them come in clean first time? We, uh, uh, it, it's interesting when we first came in we would have audit findings and, and uh, you go back and listen and some of our audit managers would say that you know hey um, you're going, to, you're going to get a call from, from one of the county officials. And I said, uh, okay. And they said, well, they're going to ask you to take this finding out of the report. And uh, my comment to her was, well, it's, is it material to the audit? And they said, yes. I said, do you have supporting documentation? They said, yes. I said, it'll remain in the report. I said, well, you'll probably get a phone call. And I did the next day. I wanted to know if I'd go to lunch. I said, I don't have time for lunch. I said, what about breakfast? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I've got time for coffee. And then, uh, when they got there, they said, okay, I want to know what, what's going to take for this to come out of the report. And I said, simple, don't do it next year, it won't be in the report. And that was the mindset that auditors were being told to take things out. And I told them, I said, don't, we will never put anything in an audit report because of politics. We will never withhold anything out of a report because of politics. And because we are putting those findings in our report, what we're finding is the counties are correcting those measures and actually doing a better job. Mm -hmm. So. Well, uh, let's uh, shift uh, a little bit now to a, a bigger picture, and uh, and I, I don't know exactly how this got tied to you, but but it's it's an interesting idea, and that is the idea of, a, of the the bicameral Uni unicameral. Yeah, I'm sorry. We, cur we currently unicameral. have a bicameral, yeah, which is 
and uh, you know, I'm, I'm basing this on my uh, my college government class and my high school civics class. But basically, if you have a state senate and a house of representatives at the state level, that's a bicameral. Right. Okay. And so there's this concept, and the state of Nebraska has one of only having one legislative unit. Right. And that would be a unicameral. That's correct. Okay, now you've exhausted everything I know about it, I think. Well, and, and, and so, let, me, let me tell you so this. What, 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 what are we talking about here? Well, Why would with, we do that? with the, uh, the current budget crisis, I say current, it's been a long, long ongoing budget crisis of the fact that the amount of money that we fund for government doesn't match the amount of needs and the amount of government we seem to want. Mm -hmm. um, so when you start looking at things, one of the things in addition to doing financial statement audits or investigative audits, we also do performance audits. And a performance audit is where you go and you look to see not just whether it's spent legally, but whether it's spent efficiently and effectively and whether you can make better use of those resources. Uh, we've done a lot of those. We did one on the Indian Cultural Center. We just recently did one uh, on the Department of Corrections. A lot of recommendations that are coming in, uh, being moved forward in the Department of Corrections were from our recommendations. But looking at the budget situation, you said, I said if you did a performance audit on the two largest agencies at the state capitol, you'd come to the conclusion that basically they're doing the same thing. And so the recommendation would be either to consolidate the two or to eliminate one. It just happens to be the state house and senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nebraska looked at this back in, back in the 30s. And what they did is they basically eliminated their House of Representatives. They had 133 members between the House and the Senate. They ended up with a Senate that just had 43 members. Now, since then, they've gone up to 49. But they cut the cost of their legislature by 60% by doing that. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's funny because someone says, well, you, your problem is you think of things too much as an accountant. <laughs> and my response is, well, your problem is you think of too, too many things as a politician. And, you know, they said, well, we've always done it this way. Well, the bicameral was pretty much patterned after the U.S. government. And back when, when the, the Constitutional Congress met, they originally came up with the idea of having representation based on population. Mm -hmm. And that was the House of Representatives. And then you had the smaller states like, like Rhode Island and Connecticut said, well, hold it, you guys will have so much more representation, we'll be insignificant. They said, well, what we'll do is we'll set up the Senate. And the Senate will be based on states' rights, and every Senate or every state will get two. So you have equal representation in this body, and then you also have the added benefit of saying, okay, if, if a bill gets passed through here, then we can slow it down and take a, a better look at it by looking at it twice. But if you go through and look at what Nebraska did, and if you say, okay, when Oklahoma was set up as a state, every county that had less than one percent population got one representative. If you had more than one percent to two, you got another one. From two to three, you got one. And then over a certain amount, for every two percent more, you got an additional representative. In the Senate, the 19 biggest counties each got a senator. Hmm. The other 58 counties, two counties shared a senator. So 58 divided by two is 29. Right. 29 plus 19 is 48. So that's how we came up with it. You never had a county that had more than, uh, more than one senator. You never had a senator that had more than two counties. And what years was that between? Uh, that was set up in it was statehood, and okay. then basically in 1964, the Supreme Court came and said you can't do that. It's got to be based on population. Let me jump in and get us to a break. We'll come back because I find this fascinating how our, our our state's history has led us to the uh, uh, bicameral system. And the concept today is why don't we consider a unicameral system? Gary Jones, a state auditor, is our guest. We'll be right back on the verdict. land to us is how we make our living. It's not an easy life. This land that OERB restored for me had pump jack stands. It had old building foundations with pipes sticking out of them. I could never have been able to afford to do these improvements like OERB did. They didn't just come out and put a Band-Aid on it. It's back to the prairie. Good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. 
Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with State Auditor Gary Jones. And when we left, we were discussing kind of the history of how we got to the current level of state senate, state representatives, this bicameral system. And uh, you were explaining that in 1964, the state Supreme Court made some changes. Yeah, and uh, actually the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme okay. Court came and said that it has to be one person, one vote. And so instead of having uh, representation based on counties. We now had representation in the House based on population divided by 101 and the mm -hmm. Senate population divided by 48. Where before we never had a county that had more than one senator and never had a senator that had more than two counties. We now have one senator that represents nine counties and we have one, one county that has nine senators. So the whole dynamic has changed. And because of that, the, the cost of operating the House and the Senate, the Senate is, is about $15 million a year when you take their annual budget, plus there's monies that go into an agency called the Legislative Service Bureau that, that puts money in for both the House and Senate. So if we eliminated the State Senate, when Nebraska went from 133 members in the House and Senate down to 43, ultimately they have 49. If we eliminated the State Senate, it cost about $300,000 on average per senator. And you could eliminate 15 to $20 million every year by, by doing that. And someone says, well, you don't have that that balance of two different bodies. Well, you mm -hmm. can create a balance within the one body. And the way you do that, for instance, now we have a 24-hour rule that says a bill is supposed to be posted for 24 hours before it can be heard. Nebraska has a five-day rule. Uh, you can set up dual committee structures that require the bill to go through two different committees as opposed to two different bodies. Um, we open everything up to the internet. We make it we make it subject to open meetings, to open records. Right now, one of the things that happens is if you have a bill that passes the House and it passes the Senate in a different version, they go to what's called conference committee. And you're thinking that the purpose is to work out their differences, but many times something comes out you've never seen or never heard of at the last minute. This way, we provide a whole lot more transparency, a whole lot more accountability. Uh, you make everything on the internet where the public can see it. And I would much rather see an informed public watching politicians instead of politicians watching politicians. Mm -hmm. And we can do this in such a way that, and I can't think of a single thing where we could save $15 million a year that will have less of an impact on core services. In fact, it will have a positive impact. Mm -hmm. What would it take to make a change like that? I assume it, it's it's not a, easily done. No, it's not. That's why Nebraska is the only one. Is that most most states you would have to take it through the legislature, and they're not going to vote to eliminate their own jobs. So, and and Oklahoma's not going to do it either because there has been a bill that's been proposed by Senator uh, uh, Patrick Anderson out of out of Enid. Uh, one year he said that a bill to eliminate the House, and the House members said, "Oh, you're just doing this because you're a senator." Well, the next year he said, "Okay, let's eliminate the Senate." but he has not gotten a hearing in any committee. They don't even want to hear it. Uh, so what would have to happen is have to be done by initiative petition, by taking it to the voters. So what we're doing is going out and gathering information and, and, and looking at putting together an initiative that says, okay, we put, put it together, take it to the Secretary of State, the Attorney General would look at it. Once they determine that it's proper and ready to go, then you would have 90 days to get signatures signed and you'd have to get a little over 124,000 signatures to put it on the ballot. I see. And, and then, so that would be a constitutional change? It would be a constitutional change. And, and someone said, well, how do you think you'll get somebody to sign this? I said, if I said that we want to eliminate one-third of the politicians in Oklahoma City and save $15 million, the <laughs> response is, where do I sign? <laughs> well, what, is, what cost are we talking about? What does it cost to run the these branches of government. Well, it's it's uh, and here's what you've got is is you have the Office of Management and Enterprise Services that has their budget office and we we go through the process of doing our budget and in fact we submitted our budget on October 1st for 2017. Uh, we go through a whole long process. 
And then, that's the governor's executive budget. It'll come out with her state of the state speech once they put everything together. And then what happens is every year that budget is dead and they we start with the political budget and then they start playing let's make a deal. And so, um, you know, we could save at least $15 million. Some said that's a drop in the mm -hmm. bucket. And I said, well, you know what? If you think saving $15 million is a drop in the bucket and shouldn't be considered, you probably shouldn't be in, in office. Because there, while there are other things that we could do to save more money, we're not doing them. And so we're saying this is a great idea to make things more open, more efficient, and then maybe what we need to do is start looking at the next item that, that mm -hmm. we, we do to start saving money. What, is the, what does the budget look like for next year? Well, the budget, uh, based on what we're seeing, and, and, and I'm on the Board of Equalization, and we don't know what those final numbers will be, I, I know in December uh, we'll, we'll certify the initial numbers. Um, in December of 2014, we thought we were have $300 million less than we did the previous year. When we certified the final numbers in February, that number was $611 million. And everything is indicating that, that number is going to be higher this year. Mm. And, and so, that's basically because of the lower energy prices? Is uh, it's a combination of things. I mean, we've we've cut state income tax. We've we've uh, we've had these tax credits that we've we've uh, you know that we need to get a handle of. We we wish that we could have done the review and the oversight in our office, but the legislature chose not to have us do that. Uh, but because of declining revenues uh, and increased expenses in some areas, you know, there's some areas that you are required to put more money in. So subsequently, what happens is those agencies that are left have less resources to, mm -hmm. to go around. I, we've, we've, got to, we've got to figure out not just how to incrementally cut some things in government. We're going to have to figure out how to permanently cut some things out of government. If, unless, you know, because the people don't want to fund more. If they don't want to fund more, we've got to find out what needs to be done away with, either through consolidation or complete elimination. As you know, municipalities are heavily reliant on sales tax. Right. Over half our money in Oklahoma City, half our revenue for the general fund comes from sales tax. Um, do you have opinions on whether or not that's a good way to fund municipal government or would you like to see some changes? Well, I, I think that you know what you have is you have schools that primarily re depend, schools and counties depend on ad valorem tax. You have mm -hmm. you know cities and municipalities predominantly depend on, on sales tax. There's, there's different combinations thereof. Uh, what we've got to do is start figuring out how we can do things more efficiently, whether it's working with cities. Uh, you know, one thing about it is, is we talked about unicameral. Uh, cities are unicameral. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what I have found is that when you go through and you look, cities are a lot quicker to respond to problems. They can look at a problem, they can make a decision, they can move forward. And, and I'm amazed at how inefficient state government is. Um, you know, uh, one of the recommendations that we had in the Indian Culture Center audit was that that somebody locally, either the city or the county, take responsibility for that. And, and a big portion of that re uh, recommendation had to do with the, you know, your maps pro projects. You know, from from concept to to completion, you, you've shown that you can get it done and get it done efficiently on time. And the state seems like everything we do. It costs tremendously more and takes tremendously longer than what's expected. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've got to start figuring out some way to make government more efficient. And there may be some things that we have to start doing with cities and counties and the state to say, mm -hmm. while we all are doing these things, maybe we need to sit back and say, okay, maybe we have a better model out there that we can do it more efficiently. You know, at the, at the federal level, there's, there's generally talk from the right about just completely eliminating uh, certain departments at, right. at the federal level. Are there state departments that get discussions like that? Or are there state departments that, that could be eliminated with, with little um, uh, impact? There, there are some. I mean, we, we did an audit on one agency and basically our recommendation out of that audit was that you need to seriously consider merging this with another agency or determine whether or not it needs, needs to be a function of state government. They merged it with another agency. For what they were, were spending $700,000, they were getting done for $200,000 more efficiently. Mm -hmm. The audit costs ten thousand dollars. They're saving five hundred thousand dollars a year. Those are the kind of things that we really need to start looking at. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed right now because uh, there'll be an interim study on a particular subject today by the Senate. Two weeks later, there'll be an interim study by the House. Mm -hmm. And then when the session comes, they don't do anything about it. Right. And 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 so we need to quit talking about things so much, and we need to really start focusing on what we can do and actually getting those things done. And technology is really a driver in a lot of these efficiencies. It, it is. It really is. And, and you know, uh, like I said, the fact that when, whenever the legislature was originally set up with two bodies, one watching the other, we didn't know what was going on until we read about it a week later in the newspaper. Wow. 
-hmm. Now we can see it live going on. And we've seen cases to where a bill comes through and the public sees it and says, hold it, that's not what I want. Next thing you know, you've got, you've got citizens at the Capitol and they get it stopped. All right. Gary Jones has been our guest. Gary's one of the fastest shows I can remember. Thanks for, Thank you. for coming on and, and handing out so many uh, opinions on state government. Gary Jones is the state auditor. And uh, I'll be back with a final word right after this. Thank you. There are now 11 million of us who live here and work here. I was 15 when I came here six years ago. I raised my family here, I drive my truck to my job every day. The only difference between now and six years ago, I do illegally. I wanted to because this is my home. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We have uh, uh, children coming from a different lifestyle, different mindset. You have to open your arms and really do what you have to do to have that child become a part of your family. And if it's more patience, that's what you do. Kids got to know they can trust you. And that's what we try to do with these kids. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett, your host today, and we were visiting with Gary Jones, who's the state auditor. I think one of the more provocative things Gary talked about today was the, having a unicameral legislative system in the state of Oklahoma. You know, you, you have a state senate, you have a state house. Gary's idea is, why don't we just have one? Well, something worth thinking about. Um, we have a website information. You can get more information about Gary's department at sai.ok.gov. And we have a website, theverdict.tv. Head to our website and tell us about a guest you'd like to see. I'll be back next week with another show. See you then.